Our second session this morning is on public engagement. And uh, we're going to start with a presentation by Leanne uh, Kaler from the University of Texas. And I'm sorry. Well, I, di I didn't, <laughs> obviously. OK, we're going to start with Rob Dunn from North Carolina State, who is remotely presenting. Am I all set? Yes, go ahead. Oh, great, sorry. So, so I'll just go ahead and get going. And I apologize for being remote. I'm going to try to be extra succinct. And my slides are extra word wordy to compensate. Um, I'll just start with some, some context, which is to say that today I'm wearing two of my hats. And so one of my hats is as a scientist who engages the public, and the other is as somebody who writes about science for the public. Next slide. And, and so in that latter context, I've actually started to write a, a new book um, inspired by and with Sloan on the biology of homes and the history and evolution and where the public fits into that story. And so I'll be drawing on some of those insights today. Next slide. My four main points today, if you want to um, relax after this first slide, are that anybody who first, anybody that tells you that we mostly understand the life in homes is lying. And if not lying, maybe um, underestimating the magnitude of our ignorance and overestimating the, the grandeur of, of our light. Um, the second is that the future of understanding homes must involve the democratization of science, including the questions that we're asking. The third is that in democratizing the study of homes, we're democratizing the study of life in general, which is to say that looking out from homes, we see the whole world because we now live everywhere. And the fourth is that in democratizing the study of homes, we have a huge opportunity to conjoin discovery and education. Now I'm going to walk through those points in a little more detail. Next slide. I'm stuck in my own slides. There we go. Um, and so, next slide. And so, I actually started off my career as an anti-ecologist. And so for the first part of my career, I was thinking about things like this ant head on the left, if you're seeing the right slide, or this cast of an ant nest on the right. And I was fascinated by these things. Next slide. But I would go to give talks for the public. And again and again, at the end of these talks, people would ask me, what should I do about the ants in my kitchen? As the, and as a tropical ant ecologist, this was the ant biologist version of the dinner party question to doctors. Hey, can you check out this rash? I hated it because I loved ants. I didn't want them to do anything about them. But it took me a while, next slide, to realize that this was really code for, this is the only possible way that your boring hour long talk and implicitly life work on which it is built seems to have any relevance to me. And, and so, it was, in, it was in this figuring that I started to think about what I was really offering to the public and how better to listen to the public. And the other thing that happened at about this point in my career, next slide, is we started studying places like medians and Broadway. And so this is an article about some of our work. And I love this picture because it shows a woman studying my friend James Danoff Burke as he studies ants. Next slide. <laughs> And what we realized is that we could not, not eliminate the middleman here. We can engage this woman in studying ants. And so we did. Next slide. So we started a project in which kids were, were able to go out and sample their ants in their backyard. And this, this project spread around the world. Next slide. And it showed us a lot about the distribution of ant species because we had specimens sent in and experts ID'd them. But it also allowed us to do a new evolutionary biology on things that are hard to get samples of. And it led us, next slide, there should be a slide of um, our different projects, forehead mites, arthropods, wildlife. This led us to a huge initiative in which we sought to engage the public in doing many, many kinds of science. And it led us to hire new faculty members, all with the idea that we, we could be doing a much better job of engaging everyone in what we do. And the, at right, as of right now, we reach about 2 million people a year in, in one way or another with our projects, and about 20,000 of those people gather data. Next slide. Eventually, those projects led us not just from backyards, but actually into one of the places that's hardest to study, because when you knock on somebody's door and say, we'd like to sample the ants in your backyard, people mostly let, let us in. If we say, we'd like to crawl into your bed and swab, it's less often the case. And so engaging the public here worked in a great way. Next slide. 
And so we did a first study where we sampled 50 homes in Raleigh and Durham. And next slide. And we sampled in those homes a bunch of habitats like other people in this room. And we started to see differences, next slide, in what lived in the dust in those samples. Next slide. And we saw a structure among the habitats in the homes, which related it back to the way I used to think about rainforests. And so toilet seats and pillowcases are similar, similar, which nobody likes, but reflects our deep biology. Next slide. And we showed that among houses, dogs matter a lot. They disproportionately structure the variation among houses. But then this led me, led us as a big collective, to start to think about a big bio blitz. What would it look like to sample thousands of homes? And so with partnership from Sloan and NSF, we did, we, sampled, we had people sample 1,500 homes and all those orange dots are people who also provided their medical records and genome data for themselves. And so this was a huge, wonderful thing for me because I'd written early in my career about attempts to find everything in a place, you know, in Costa Rica, in the Smoky Mountains. And this for me was a way to find everything in a house. If we can't do Costa Rica, maybe we can do a house. Next slide, it should say from, from dust. And so with the magic of Noah Fuhrer's abilities on the metagenomics, we were able to look at in these homes, bacteria, archaea, fungi, plants, and animals, all on the basis of dust samples and sequencing approaches. This made my lab look like Santa's workshop for a long time, and it still really does. But it showed us all kinds of things, and, but mostly for this talk, it's revealed how ignorant we are. And so we found more kinds of archaea, next slide, in homes than were known from Earth when I was a graduate student, which is not as long, well, I don't think it's that long ago, others might. Um, we found, next slide, tens of thousands of kinds of bacteria relative to birds and mammals. This makes them look silly. Next slide. We found more kinds of fungi in houses than there are named fungi in North America. Next slide. And so for your own curiosity, we then, began to look at the structure in those houses. So climate matters, ventilation matters, cats matter as well as dogs, number of people, gender. We've actually now shown that there's a gene variant in humans that seems to structure a lot of the differences in some kind of microbes. This is super new and I put up an ugly slide to emphasize not to pay much attention to it, but this is where we're going and that's what's possible. But the big point there is we don't know very much. These are hundreds of thousands of species if we look across these taxa. And then even when we think we know a lot, when we do something like sample chimpanzee nests, which should look like our homes in some ways, it can change the whole story. And so Megan Temis and Fiona Stewart recently did this, and they found that while chimpanzee nests have almost no fecal material, this compares to daycares. Uh, next slide, this should be the modern norm, seems both regional and new. That, that even having all of these associates in our homes is a new kind of thing. And so the second main point, next slide, in the context of this work is that the future of understanding all of what's in there has got to rely on democratizing science, but not just in collecting data, which we've done lots of, but in terms of asking questions. As an example of this, at one point in this study, we asked people, what lives with you in your home? Just to get a free list. And one of the things people said were camel crickets. Next slide, should be a camel cricket. And, and so we asked, and people said, yeah, we have these things, we have camel crickets. But then we asked, well, you know, do you or don't you have them? And in one day, we got a map of 500 houses or do or didn't have them. And the red dots are people who said they did have them, and the white dots are people who said they didn't have them. And we knew, next slide, we knew based on studies of camel crickets that the public was clearly wrong, which is what we always assume when the public shows us something that's not what we think we should see. And so we next asked people to send us pictures of the camel crickets. And that's when we were in for a surprise that instead of the native camel crickets we were looking for, it was a giant Japanese camel cricket. The next slide. Next slide, it should now say Deastrema Essenamora. A giant Japanese camel cricket that's moved house to house across North America unnoticed. Next slide. In addition to another Japanese species that moved house to house unnoticed. And we only looked at this because people said it was there and it was interesting. Next slide. But then the next thing people said was, who cares? What should I do about it? And this is one of these questions I was trained as a scientist to hate because it's teleological. They don't have some goal. They're just species doing their wild thing. But we thought, well, maybe we should think about this. What, what, what use to society could they have? Because that's how we justify our grants. 
And so we thought, well, maybe they're eating really recalcitrant carbon compounds. Maybe they have microbes that would help to allow them to break down things like lignin. And so we formed a partnership with new collaborators, looked in these camel crickets, and we have now, based on the bacteria species in these camel crickets' guts, doubled the number of lignin-degrading bacteria species known from Earth, only because people asked us what good they are. This then led us to look in houses more generally. Next slide with Michelle Trotwein and the Cal Academy folks. And we've now, next slide, now looked in 50 houses in Raleigh, and we're now moving around the world, and found 2,000 animal species living in houses. Next slide. And we can use these data from detailed studies of houses with metagenomics to actually now start to map the distribution of different animal species. Next, this is the first map of a uh, dust mite species distribution, amazingly. Next slide, that's a dust mite. Don't you love them? I, I like them, but I'm biased. Uh, next slide. As another example, this is a spitting spider. This spits a ball of silk on its prey. It's never been found outdoors in eastern North America. It's one of the most common spiders in Raleigh houses. We know nothing about what it's doing there. We didn't even know it was there. And so to me, next slide, to imagine that we understand the microbiome of the built environment when we have no idea what a giant spider is doing is probably hubris. <laughs> next slide. Ah, sorry, I'm getting stuck. Um, a third point in democratizing the study of homes, we are democratizing the study of life in general. Next slide. We can start to look not just in homes by studying homes, but also outside of homes. And so this is a map of fecal microbes on the outside of houses based on the same kinds of samples. Next slide. We think this relates to the dairy cows, beef cows, swine, and maybe even chickens outside of homes in some region. Arkansas turns out to be a shitty place. Um, <laughs> move on. We can also look at things like plant pathogens from these same home samples. This is a path, next slide, a Utipa dieback is a pathogen of grapevines. We've now expanded the distribution of this pathogen based on samples that the public took. Next slide. We can also look at insect distributions. The green is box elder tree. The pink are places we found box elder bugs, which largely matches the distribution of the tree, but extends the known distribution of the bug, again, based on houses. And we have these kinds of maps for 200,000 species. Next slide. And so to me, when I look at this, this NASA image of lights on Earth, it's a measure of our impact, of our light pollution, but it's also a measure of our ingenuity, of all the places we can measure what's outside and what's inside if we engage the public in helping us to measure. Next slide. And so we can envision a billion families potentially able to help us to understand the world where it most matters to them. And this gets more and more possible as technology improves. Next slide. My last point is that in democratizing the study of homes, we have a huge opportunity to join discovery and education. Next slide. Should show a, a Renaissance dissection. And so if, if we think back to the, the, the early Renaissance, end of the Dark Ages, one of the things we sort of is laughable now is, is what was going on then was that when they did dissections, they would look for what the Greeks and Romans already did because they assumed everything was known and they were just trying to discover old knowledge. And then of course what happens next is the scientific renaissance happens and we, we realize we can discover new things. Next slide. To me, the tragedy here is that that scientific renaissance never reaches education. And so when we have kids do dissections, they still literally do dark ages dissections. They look for what's already known. And so this got us thinking that what if we can engage kids in doing real science with dissections, but I'm with, with all sorts of other sorts of science too. Next slide. And so we started a project called Students Discover, linking discovery and education in light of both the science of teaching and the tools of discovery. Next slide. And in this program, teachers, scientists, education scholars come together to co-create lesson plans, all built on citizen science. Teachers test the lesson plans in classrooms and do evaluation. The lessons go online, the lessons spread to other classes. Data accumulate as classes use lessons. Scientists do science with the classes. And we want to reach 10,000 classes, and we're actually well on our way. The next slide is one that I usually use to say how cool this is and how happy the teachers are. But I'll tell you the truth. This has not been easy. There's been a lot of crying, and I don't just mean me. But it's starting to work, and we're starting to be able to bring this kind of experience to classrooms and around the world. 
And soon we'll have two, next slide, 200 lesson plans for 200 different citizen science projects, partnering with Science Charter and now Science Friday to get this around the world. And our goal is to get 1,000 different citizen science projects for which we have lesson plans. Next slide. And so the products here become new science, formal education, teacher and student, student engagement, digital content, new books that I can talk about more later. Next slide. A lot of this is with microbes. So we have American gut lesson plans we're working on, belly button biodiversity, meet your mites, insect pathogen discovery, a sourdough project, the shower hood gunk project, and we're working on a field guide for common microbes that makes all of this easier. Next slide. But one of the coolest things that's emerged as a result of this is that kids ask more and better questions than anybody. And so we're now starting projects that have been influenced by what kids want to know. We're always keeping in mind here, and I'm almost done, that, that the kid, kid questions that aren't framed the way we frame them, and yet they're still interesting. And so why are some shower heads gross? That's interesting from a kid perspective, or in scientists speak, what determines what lives on shower heads, when pathogens are present, and the extent to which such pathogens pose a risk. Next slide. Kids want to know why does some water taste funny and some taste good? Or in scientists speak, does the composition of microbe taxa on water influence water's flavor and what influences which microbes are in tap water? And we're doing taste studies with this as well. Next slide. Or kids ask what the deal is with dandelions? Why are they grow everywhere? Or in scientists, do the micro microbes associated with dandelion roots help them to survive extreme environments? And can we use those microbes like probiotics? Next slide. What else does my cat bring in? Or in scientists, species are vectored by cats. Does it depend on how cats move and where cats live? That's my cat, and that's a funny story about my cat on the left, which I can tell you later. Next slide. <laughs> Ask what lives in my kitchen salt. Turns out we don't have that many good studies of this, even though studying pepper and pepper water is how microbes, microbiology began. And so we've started studying this. And the question in a scientist context is, do the conditions in kitchen salt mimic those needed by Halophiles and favor unique lineages. Next slide. And so as we move forward, we want to bring all this together to garden good things. And what we often imagine is building. We imagine figuring out how to get the pathogens out of drywall, which we now know are there. Next slide. We imagine great things like this. Next slide. But where we're going is actually thinking about the ways we already garden in homes. Can we engage pop the public in a positive way about microbes they already like to think about what this means? The garden of the future, a garden amidst the grandeur of a living world and the relative impotence of our human efforts and knowledge. Next slide. And so what do I do about the ants in my kitchen in this light? You study it and its microbes with scientists. Next slide. And you do it in light of better and better tools because the molecular tools are changing, the data are changing, the data tools are changing. Next slide. What's not changing yet is our ability to integrate educational tools. We need to do a much better job of this and build on literature and actively assess. Same applies to informal education. And what is changing but changing in the wrong direction is our natural history, life history, and the ability to culture and sniff and know life. This is the tool we're leaving behind. And so in conclusion, I think we have the opportunity to simultaneously make major strides in discovery, improve education, and answer societal questions. Homes are not just homes. They're a window along with the families in them through which we can study the whole world. And to do the next step, to make all this work applied, we must listen to diverse publics to know what matters. We must pay attention to natural history. We must do experiments. We must retain the ability to study individual species in detail. Thank you. Do we have some questions with Rob while he's still on? Yes, Jack. Rob, Rob, are you there? Rob? Hey, Jack. Rob, where are you? Um, I'm just looking at the scene. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, good. good. Um, uh, so one of, the, one of the big things that uh, we were talking about earlier was epidemiological evidence to support it. And um, I, I know you mentioned this briefly in your um, JMBE paper, but 
uh, trying to link some of the data from your home study to health outcomes in the people in those homes. Wouldn't that be really cool? Yes, so I mean, we, we, we have the data for um, 300 of those homes. And it, I mean, it's just the next, it's the next step for us, but we've not been able to do it yet. But we have asthma data, and then we have self-reported data for all the homes. It's some place we'd like to go, but we're not there yet. We just pulled together the genomes for the, the subset of the people for which we have that. I mean, as you know, once this gets this big, the data uh, across these different types become immense. But we're, we're moving there. Is it probably it's totally unsatisfying, but sorry, Jack. No, it's, it's, it's exactly where we're all standing. Uh, it's just the way it is. But I'm really glad to hear that you are gathering that data and it, putting it out as a public record is important. Thanks. How? Rob. Um, uh, Rob, is it on? Y yeah. Um, I wonder if you wondered if you were a microbe, what would you want to know about buildings um, to sort of enhance what it is that you're about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm jet lagged enough that I may go deep with this question. Um, <laughs> So, so I think that's a good question. Um, so we, we think about this a lot with insects, that the scale of the house relative to an insect is very different, and so how they're experiencing that environment. And, and so to, to take it even smaller and to think about what are the relevant scales for microbes. And, and one of the things that I think emerges from doing that, um, I guess I would beg that question of us all, right? There are lots of people in the room is able to speak to this as me. Um, it is, is that the resources can be very patchy. Um, and, and so to a microbe, you know, to, if we think about our home, a salt shaker is the funny thing away in the cabinet and not much of a resource. But from a microbial perspective, a salt shaker can be a very big deal as a very unusual habitat. Um, and, and so I, I think thinking about these patchy but important resources, if I were a microbe, that would be an important next step. And if I were a specific kind of microbe, if I were a halophile, then the house looks very different than if I'm something else. You know, if I'm a halophile, I could actually probably go, probably go through and check off what's a habitable place for me. Um, and so I think part of that, I mean, to my mind, is natural history, that we need to know enough about these different kinds of microbes to predict what they might be doing. Um, and I think we actually stand in a moment in which we're at risk of losing some of that knowledge um, about what, what a microbe thinks about these environments. And, and so I think it's a, it's a, it is a key moment to link the people who can still grow things with the people with the most amazing sequencing ability and, and to pull that together, uh, which I also think speaks to this question of, you know, what's living and dead in the house? How much biomass is there? Which, which I think we've only done a... a pretty cursory job of thinking about. I can't see, I can't make eye contact, so I can't tell if that's answering a question or not, Hal. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a good start, and, and you brought up the issue of if you were a specific species, and I guess for me, I assume that the answer would be different depending on what species you happen to be imagining yourself to be at the time, and, and I think that um, what we could do with what we think we know already is what we call reverse engineering. So, so, so to take what we found out and try to look at it from the perspective of a species, and, and one of the, I don't know, were, were you able to watch Brent Stevens' talk? No, I was, I was not, unfortunately. No. So, so he summarized, he did a wonderful job of summarizing a lot of what's been learned in the last 10 years using uh, the, the, the new generation uh, sequencing methods, but they're generally at the genus level and not at the species level, and, and they don't generally tend to distinguish between what's alive and, and what's uh, 
a fragment of, 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 of or a copy of something that that was one. So I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of answering my own question. Yeah. Let, let's have one more question and then move on. And as hey, I hate being cop. So I, I just have a question about uh, if you've uh, how, how you've dealt with this uh, idea of who quote unquote owns the data when you're doing this kind of citizen science. Actually, and if I could interject something yeah. similar, how about IRB approval, Institutional Review Board approval? Yeah, um, I think I heard part of the first question. I'll, I'll answer those two together, maybe in, in pipe pipe if I'm missing. Um, so we have IRB approval for all of these things, and so the, the data become DN, uh, they become anonymized, um, and then the geography becomes blurred relative to where the houses are. And we do that even for our insect studies, which nobody requires. Um, uh, and, and so the, we report back the data to people about their own houses. Um, and then we, we provide the data for all the houses, but with that geographic anonymization is our approach. Uh, and I guess I'm speaking pretty broadly. It's changed a little bit through time as we've been more thoughtful about this. Um, and I, I do think that the, close, the more and more we go inside, the more and more it's important to have an ethicist on board actually with some of these projects. I don't, yeah. Um, does that answer the, the question? I mean, the other thing that we started to think about is, like with the camel crickets, if we find something that's really useful, who owns it? Uh, and, and we hadn't thought that, about that before. Um, and it turns out not to be an issue with the camel cricket. Um, but so, for example, with the, the things in salt shakers, we're finding some really unique enzymes in the species living in salt shakers. Um, so, what does ownership look like for those enzymes? And I've never heard a discussion about that uh, in light of house sampling. Okay, thank you very, very much. And again, you know, every one of the topics we talk on, I, I think we could spend the rest of the day, but time <laughs> constraints are real. So thank you, Professor Stevens. And uh, now we can finally uh, switch topics and have our next speaker. And um, are you able to stay on line? I, I am time-wise. Is it technically okay. feasible? The technology? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Now we get uh, Leanne from the University of Texas.